Welcome to our webinar. Um, really fantastic to have you all with us. This is, uh, I'm Amanda Harding. I'm gonna be moderating today uh, for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. We are just about to start. There's some last minute technical operations going on. I think everybody knows what that's like. We are learning, uh, but still nine months into the pandemic and we're still learning how to get this right. Um, Please remember that if you would like to be uh, using interpretation, you can do that. We have three languages, English, French, and Spanish. On the panel today, we'll mostly be speaking in English, but not only, we will have some French as well. We also are using Slido for all our questions, and we will have some time for questions to the panelists today. Um, so again, please use Slido, but we've already opened a poll asking you where you're coming from. Uh, so if you go to Slido, take your smartphone, put in the code EMC, every move counts, EMC, uh, or use the uh, QR code, which is uh, also on the screen. Uh, it'd be great to know where you're coming from. Uh, we're not going to be looking at the Zoom chat at all. Uh, we will be only looking at Slido for your questions and for the polls. Um, so it's just good to have that in mind. Uh, I am going to get a little bit of a heads up when we're ready to go from Fiona. I can see that that's uh, coming up in, in just a moment. But again, as I said, it's just incredibly exciting to have everybody here. We've got a huge crowd coming way beyond our expectations today. Um, from across the world. We know that we've probably got around, I don't know, last count, we were looking at over 50 countries, um, every sector. Uh, so again, uh, super to have you all with us uh, with a very exciting uh, panel as well coming on. Uh, Fiona, do you, want to, do you want to take it on from here? And we'll formally open, but this was just a sort of chit chat to warm everybody up. Over to you, Fiona. We can't hear you right now. Thank you very much, Amanda, and a very warm welcome to everyone to this afternoon. A good afternoon, a good morning, and a good evening to all of you around the world joining. And again, a warm welcome to colleagues and friends to this landmark global webinar organized to celebrate the launch of the 2020 WHO Guidelines on Physical Activity and Sedentary Behaviour. I'm Dr. Fiona Bull, Head of the Physical Activity Unit at the World Health Organization here in Geneva. I'm delighted to commence the webinar knowing that we are joined by over 4,000 people who have registered for the today's event, and many are still joining as we commence. We think there's already over 60 countries represented, and I'm sure we're still counting. This is so encouraging and a true demonstration of the global interest in the importance of physical activity and the benefits it has for health and society. First of all, to open the webinar, I would like to invite Assistant Director General of the Division of the Universal Health Coverage Healthier Population Division, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, to provide an introductory welcome. Thank you, Dr. Naoko. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Amanda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues and friends of the Global Physical Activity Community. Today is a very important day for our collective global work on physical activity. And we are pleased to have so many of you to join us to celebrate the launch of the new WHO guidelines of the physical activity and sedentary behavior. The World Health Organization knows that physical activity is very important for global health and well-being. Physical activity creates healthier populations and contributes to the healthier environment. Our work supporting countries to promote, encourage, enable physical activity is vital. And we recognize that your work and valuable support is critical for this shared ambition. Today, we will hear about the guidelines and you will discuss the opportunity and the challenges 
of their implementation so we can achieve the goal, uh, global target of a 15% improvement in physical activity worldwide as set out in the Global Action Plan in 2018. We call on your continued support to enhance and inform this work so that together we can make this world more active, healthier, and happier. From the latest evidence, it is clear every move counts for everyone, everywhere, every day. I wish you a successful symposium and look forward to our ongoing collaboration and partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Naoko, for joining us and for setting the context for this occasion and also outlining the importance of physical activity and its position within WHO and the global health agenda. The launch today of the new guidelines is the culmination of an enormous amount of hours of work, not just by those directly involved in the development of the process, but beyond by the thousands of scientists and researchers that produce the evidence and also by those who work in the field and practice using the evidence to promote physical activity. All that collective work underpins and informs these guidelines. Today, you will hear more about the guidelines, what they are, the science, and some of the key changes that we have uh, identified and made in these 2020 guidelines. But by design, we will also hear, and the majority of the time of this webinar, is to hear from those across the ecosystem of physical activity, representatives from different sectors, different parts of the world, and we're hearing how these new guidelines and national guidelines can inform and accelerate our work to promote physical activity, to ensure that everyone has the environments and the opportunities to be more physically active. Hearing from the ground about how to use these guidelines is just as important as announcing that we have uh, launched them. Let me highlight through two or three of the main messages. Firstly, the main message is that physical activity protects and improves health. It's good for our hearts, our bodies and minds. And that any level of physical activity is good for health and being more active is better. We've captured all of that in a single message, every move counts. A second main message is that physical activity is good for all ages, young or old, at different key life stages, such as through pregnancy, and for all people, including those living with chronic conditions and living with disabilities. It protects against disease and improves health for everyone. And the third main message is the new element of these guidelines. It recognizing that too much sedentary behavior can be detrimental to health. And therefore it's important for everyone to limit sedentary behaviors. You will hear more about these guidelines, but now I'd like to hand back to Amanda, our moderator for today's session. What we hope will be an enjoyable, informative and engaging session. So Amanda, please tell us more and take over. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Fiona. Um, I'm just going to jump in just for a couple of minutes, um, just to give you sort of a flavor of what we've got uh, ahead of us for the next hour and a half, more or less. Um, as you've seen, we've got a great panelist, as Fiona's just said, different representing different sectors, different countries. They are all passionate about leveraging these guidelines and making a step change in physical activity and sedentary behavior. You'll also have picked up probably from my voice and my chit chat at the beginning um, that we want this webinar to reflect the dynamic and the inclusive nature of the guidelines. Um, what that means in practice is that we're gonna have an informal but content rich conversation between the panelists, but also with you, the audience. And I'm looking down at my computer, I see that we're already reaching nearly 2000 people around the world who have joined us. As a moderator, that's very scary. Um, it means it's gonna demand quite a lot of agility from all of us to try and pull those questions in to keep our responses short to the point, but really on message. 
So we'll do our best to do that, but please do put your questions, everybody through the Slido, we'll be lifting those up, we'll be keeping them all, and we'll be pausing a couple of times during the webinar to be able to, to take those questions to the panelists. Um, also, please do remember that you can listen to the webinar, you can watch it in either English, French or Spanish. So use that uh, possibility uh, because that's going to help you really engage yourselves. So before we hear from each of our panelists and ask them what they are doing to mobilize support for physical activity worldwide and build awareness of the guidelines recommendations, what we'd like to do right now is really see through a great video what today is all about. So I hope we're ready to show our first video. We have a couple of videos coming, three videos coming today. So if we could just go straight on to the video, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, I think there might have been a problem with the sound a little bit for the video for some people. We'll be showing the video again at the end of the webinar. So that should also be your sort of appetizer and persuade you to stay with us all the way through to the end. But in order to really place our webinar, our conversation that we're going to be having with our five panelists, I'm actually now going to turn to Fiona and to Juana to give us a little bit more detail about the guidelines, and then we'll enter into this, uh, uh, this real sort of crunchy conversation that we've got ahead of us. Over to you, Fiona and Juana. Thank you very much, Amanda. And if we could uh, turn to having the slides showing, please. It's a great pleasure to be able to present these slides summarizing the guidelines, the work of, I've introduced of so many people and outline some of the key messages, outline some of the key developments in the science and then tell you a little more about uh, the implications and how we hope the guidelines will be used. So we'll look for the slides to come up on the screen. Thank you very much, the short delay there, but we're ready to roll. So, in fact, we're ready to roll because this has been a long time coming. Many of you might be thinking too long, but we're absolutely delighted to reach today to launch these guidelines and really highlight how much this scientific area and the benefits of physical activity and reducing sedentary behavior sit on good science, robust science that has extended since the last WHO guidelines. What has happened? Well, there's been the growth of the field of sedentary behavior, but there's also been big changes and developments in the area and research of physical activity, developments which have shown larger studies across more countries with larger samples, with longer outcomes and measures, and particularly the use of device-based measures. The science behind the, the uh, guidelines is getting stronger and consistent in all the directions. In terms of looking at the benefits, 
I want to make sure we have everyone on the same page here. We know physical activity is defined as all movement. We know we can describe it in its intensity and also in key categories like the aerobic and the muscle strengthening. And this slide is just orientating us to show that the different moderate, moderate intensity activities that can be done in different contexts, vigorous intensity, muscle strengthening, of course, as an important and often overlooked area and type of physical activity and the new area of sedentary, defined here as those activities of very low energy expenditure. One of the areas in which the science has grown is, of course, in the breadth of health outcomes that have been uh, examined for these guidelines. The evidence reaffirms some of the well-established relationships and associations between physical inactivity, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, and cancer mortality. It's built on and extended the evidence showing associations with different cancers, no longer just breast and, and uh, um, uh, colon cancer, apologies, breast and colon cancer, but now many more, and reaffirming the benefits between hypertension and diabetes. One of the new areas where the evidence has extended is in the benefits for mental health across all ages, looking at outcomes of cognitive health uh, and learning development. The area of falls for older and younger uh, people was examined and continues to show a strong association and including and extending into areas of quality of life and physical functioning. The evidence has got stronger, more consistent and more robust methods. Instead of showing you lots of slides with each of those relationships, with each of those groups, we'd like to summarize it, not only with our headline message, but with indeed the graph that really captures the center of the message around physical activity. Every move counts because at the very lowest level, by doing more and starting to be active, you get considerable health benefits. There is a clear range of optimal uh, amount, and that is specified for uh, children and adults. And then we know that doing more physical activity is beneficial. And this is summarized in the slide for everyone to see. The science behind it, of course, is presented in all of our documentations and available to all. Looking more specifically at the adults and older adult populations, I mentioned the range and we can see 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity is recommended. And because more is better, there is an upper second recommendation about doing more. Importantly, on the slide is showing the strength training exercise. It's recommended all adults and older adults regularly muscle strengthening exercise. And a new feature is the focus on multi-component uh, physical activities for all older adults, important for preventing falls and injuries from falls, but also for maintaining physical functioning. A new development in this area, in these populations, is we no longer have a, minute, a minimum of 10 minutes of physical activity being the first bout that you need to accumulate. Why is that? It's because the evidence now from device-based measures show that all activity counts of any intensity. So those 10 minutes boundaries have been dropped. Let me move on to looking briefly at the guidelines for youth. And we see here, again, similar and continuing, the evidence reaffirms the benefits of all children reaching 60 minutes of physical activity a day across the week. There is a small change here. Previously, we had said each day, and that has now been updated to be on average 60 minutes a day. Again, you see the importance of vigorous and muscle strengthening activity for youth, all youth of all abilities. Let me invite Juana to take us through some other elements of the new guidelines with special populations. Thank you, Fiona. So for these guidelines, we've actually looked specifically at a number of subpopulation groups that were felt to be really important. The first of those is women who are pregnant or postpartum. And looking specifically at the evidence available for this subgroup, um, we can see that there is a decreased risk of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, and excessive weight gain during pregnancy. 
But physical activity also has benefits in making sure that there are no delivery complications and it's associated with a reduced risk of postpartum depression. There are also benefits for the baby. Fewer newborn complications and mothers who are physically active, there is no uh, adverse effect on, preg on um, child's birth weight and no increased risk of stillbirth. So the recommendation for pregnant and postpartum women is that they try to do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity a week. And importantly, women who were very physically active before pregnancy can continue to do these activities during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. The other special group that we looked at were people living with chronic conditions. Sorry, Fiona, can you pass the next one? Thank you. So here we looked specifically at direct evidence gathered on those who had survived a bout of cancer, cancer survivors, people living with hypertension, people living with type two diabetes, and people living with HIV, given that with the advent of antiretroviral medications, there are now many people who live with HIV as a chronic condition. And looking at that direct evidence, we were able to see that there are beneficial effects, um, both in reducing all-cause mortality, cancer-specific mortality, improving physical function, and very importantly, health-related quality of life. And in particular for people living with HIV, there were no detrimental effects on viral load or body composition. And looking at this group as a whole, the um, recommended levels of physical activity are actually the same as for the general adult and older adult population. The same benefits are seen within this range of 150 to 300 minutes a week. The importance again of muscle strengthening activities and activities that promote physical function and prevent falls in older adults. The final special population that we looked at were children, adolescents, and adults living with disability. Unfortunately here, there is actually limited evidence and research that has been conducted. Uh, so we were able to look specifically at some specific impairment groups, but felt the importance of having an inclusive recommendation. And again, the recommendations are the same as for the general child, adolescent, adult, and older adult population. Given that we felt there was no reason that people living with an impairment or a disability would not benefit in the same way for the same cardiometabolic, cancer-reducing uh, benefits that we see with physical activity in the general population. And it's also very important for mental health and physical function as a whole. Thank you very much, Wana. Thank you very much, Wana. We've already introduced that we've a uh, new addition to the guidelines is the inclusion of sedentary behavior. And we have two recommendations for the adult population, recommending that all adults of, uh, limit the amount of sedentary time. And indeed, a recommendation of the benefits of increasing physical activity to reduce the detrimental effects of sedentary time. The recommendation for sedentary applies to youth as well because the evidence shown from much research, a growing body of research, and more recently using objective or device-based measures, show unfavorable impact on health outcomes listed here of too much sedentary behavior. So the new guideline from WHO is for all ages to limit sedentary behavior. And then in particular, summarized here in this graph, and of course it builds on an extensive body of research in more recent years, is this idea that we can, in, by being more active, reduce those risks of sedentary behaviors. So it's recommended that if we have to spend a long time, like many of us at work, sitting or sedentary time, it is beneficial to do more physical activity. These messages together, provide more opportunities for people to be active in different ways, different types, and in different locations throughout the day 
and every day. Today, we've launched the guidelines with a number of documents that are available on the website. We've created and are pleased to launch simultaneously the six UN languages in the summary document form and the English version of the long document, full details with supporting science summarized in the appendix and annex, all available now on the WHO website. I mentioned that developing the guidelines is an enormous task, but actually the guidelines don't change behavior in themselves. It's what we do with them. And that is why I'm absolutely delighted to hand the floor back to Amanda and to hear from our panelists because how we use them and how they can make a difference in policy making, in investment cases, and in guiding practice around the world so that we can change the levels of physical activity and reach the goal that Dr. Naoko reminded us of, and that's a 15% improvement by 2030. So an overview of the guidelines, but more available for you to follow up. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you also, Juana. This, this is where we actually, as Fiona just said, we get into what are these guidelines, which are so rich, so evidence-based, what do they actually, what do they look like in practice? What are some of the challenges? What's the reality? And we thought that we really needed to start that sort of reality check from where we are right now. We can't have a guidelines launched today in the middle of a pandemic without actually making some reference as well to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, and to be able to do that, we're gonna start by watching an absolutely brilliant and inspirational video, which comes from We Are Undefeatable. It's led by 15 of the UK's leading health charities, supported by expertise and insight from Sport England and Sarah, who is with us, we'll talk more to that in a moment. It's funded by the National Lottery and it was developed in direct response to COVID-19, but it has been built on an already existing platform. So let's have a look at the video and then we'll turn to each of the panelists and ask them what COVID-19 has meant for themselves personally in terms of their ability to actually continue or to be more active, but also in a wider space. What has this really meant in terms of some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that this is laying out at us? But maybe let's start just with the video. I hope we can turn straight away to the We Are Undefeatable video. In 2012, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm living with bronchiectasis. Welcome to this um, dance class that we're going to be doing for the next 10 weeks. One, two, three, four. I'm going to jump straight back in again. There seems to be a slight glitch on the video but you've had a taste of it. And I'm actually gonna move straight on and welcome Sarah Ronnie, who is with us, one of our five panelists, the first I'm gonna to turn to right away. And Sarah, you are the policy lead for Health for Sport England, which is an arm's length government agency. You're working today at the heart of physical activity policy, but you come really from the front line and you're really great at making that link between the local, the national, the individual, the collective. And I hope you're gonna help us take that perspective to make sense of the guidelines to show the value that they bring. But maybe just to begin with, particularly as we didn't see all the way through to the end of the video, you could actually give a sense of what that has meant in terms of the work you have done over the last few months. Over to you, Sarah. I'm very good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation and the great introduction. Um, yeah, we've been very lucky enough um, to be able to, during COVID, develop and build on um, an existing campaign which was developed, um, as Amanda mentioned, with 15 of the leading health charities in the UK. Um, and it was very much designed with people's, um, people, it's based on or targeting those that are living with health conditions. And what was exceptionally important as part of that creative and, and developing the campaign was it was based on people's day to day lives that we really were able to demonstrate the ups and downs and the reality of living with a 
long-term health condition on a day-to-day -day basis um, so that it would really resonate with individuals but also combined with that that it was inspiring it was motivational and supported people to be more active um, and what the rest of the video would have showed you is during the pandemic we we asked um, a number of instructors so we had a, a walking football coach and a dance instructor who connected a range of people who were living with health conditions during um, COVID and um, taught them different activities and had um, training over the course of 10 weeks um, with the intention of then hopefully bringing them together to, to meet for the first time and play that first football match or, or do that first routine. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't possible, but instead what we have done is brought them together virtually instead. Um, and just to, to answer the question around what it is that um, I think this has taught us specifically, um, that unfortunately it has been exceptionally hard for people um, to get and remain active during this time. And in particular, if you already had those barriers before, for example, those living with health conditions, um, it's going to be even harder during, during the pandemic. Um, but what it has hopefully shone a spotlight on is the value that it can bring um, to both physical and, and mental health. And that's exactly what We Are Undefeatable is about. Um, and secondly, that we as a sector, and I use that term very loosely, so anyone that has uh, skin in the game in terms of increasing participation levels, has had to adapt and rapidly. Um, we as an organisation, plus the thousands of sport and physical activity organisations out there have really rallied around as best they could under ex extremely challenging circumstances for, for themselves as well, um, to make sure that there were those opportunities for people to get active wherever possible and as things have changed along the way. So we've seen examples of quite rapid innovation, trying to move things online where they can, using telephone line support um, and with behaviour change messaging. Um, and then just lastly, the thirdly, what I would say is it's really showed us that connections matter. Um, it matters to us personally now more than ever um, and that when we do it right it makes a difference so just the example in the video of Kate the dance instructor for Team Undefeatable and also in thinking about what messages will resonate and connect with people from the outset so it feels achievable particularly if you haven't been active before um, and especially if you're at the very beginning of that journey um, and that's been especially true for our campaign um, this girl can which was very much built on on insight tailored insight based on what really could cut through to the audience and same with we are undefeatable and um, that it spoke to those ups and downs and the reality of um, how people feel from day to day thank you so much sarah and, and and what i'm already hearing and anticipating is that we've got you know four other brilliant people around the table alongside the two of us who are going to be building on a lot of what you've said um you know that this so without me, I guess, sort of preempting, um, I'm actually going to turn straight away, but thank you very much. I'm going to turn straight away to Andy. Uh, so I'm going to switch quickly, uh, switch my language hat into French. Andy, ça fait vraiment plaisir hein, de vous avoir parmi nous. Uh, écologiste, ambassadeur ivoirien du vélo et des ODD, président de My Dream for Africa. Vous avez choisi, vous avez fait un choix extraordinaire dans votre vie, hein, c'est ça ce que j'ai compris, de laisser tomber une carrière euh, extrêmement réussie en communication et de mettre vos énergies, vos passions sur cette mélange, cette mixité entre euh, les bénéfices de santé et l'environnement et de rendre possible des espaces. Et là, vous êtes euh, à Abidjan aujourd'hui, vous êtes au Côte d'Ivoire, là, dans un espace où ce n'est pas forcément toujours facile ce que j'aimerais bien vous poser comme question pour commencer, par contre, et on a déjà parlé un peu, le Covid chez vous, qu'est-ce que ça a fait pour rendre plus difficile, plus possible euh, l'activité physique Je pense qu'on on pourrait croire, je pense que la Covid a eu un impact positif sur nos activités ici. Moi, personnellement, parce que déjà, en termes de distanciation sociale, le vélo répond à cette problématique. Donc, c'était l'occasion pour nous de démontrer que le, la COVID, le vélo est la mobilité de la COVID. Maintenant, euh, du point de vue culturel, je pense que de plus en plus, nos populations en Afrique sont sédentaires et c'est dû à, à un fait culturel. Ce n'est pas dans la culture des Africains de faire du sport. 
Mais par contre, c'est dans la culture des Africains de se déplacer, de marcher beaucoup. Donc déjà, je pense qu'en termes d'information, si nous axons notre stratégie de sensibilisation sur le fait de dire aux gens, même le simple fait de marcher régulièrement, c'est une activité physique, je pense que ça pourrait avoir un impact positif sur euh, l'encouragement aux populations d'exercer quelque chose de, de, de physique de façon régulière. Parce oui. qu'a priori, quand on parle de sport, la notion qu'on a ici vite fait, le sport, ce n'est pas pour tout le monde. Le sport, c'est pour des personnes aisées. Le sport, c'est pour les jeunes. Ça, c'est les, les, les seniors qui, qui te diront que le sport, c'est pour les jeunes. Donc, on a utilisé le vélo comme moyen de, de communication à un impact positif. Parce que déjà, par notion, le vélo est un mot doux. Donc, c'est un mot de sport qui n'est pas agressif. Donc, le fait de faire du loisir à vélo, et ça te permet d'avoir aussi une activité physique régulière, a, a réellement un bon impact. Mais on reste toujours focus sur la sensibilisation, sur la communication. Et ce qui nous a permis aujourd'hui d'asseoir cette notoriété autour de la petite reine qui est le vélo, c'est le simple fait de dire aux gens que certes, le vélo est un support de déplacement, mais le plus important, c'est que le vélo lutte contre les maladies cardiovasculaires. Donc, le vélo a un impact positif sur notre santé et notre bien-être. Merci beaucoup, Andy. Et, et je pense qu'on revient tout de suite en écho de ce que Fiona avait dit, que tout mouvement, tout compte, en fait. Euh, donc, on n'a pas besoin de définir comme activité sportive, soi-disant. Il faut qu'on bouge. Il faut qu'on bouge encore faut plus. Il faut, faut le rendre faut accessible bouger. à tout le monde, à portée de main de tout le monde. On va revenir un peu sur tous les défis qu'il y a dans, dans des pays différents, dans des contextes différents, un peu dans quelques minutes. Je vais, par contre, parce que j'aime bien que tout le monde a, a l'occasion de parler, au moins dans les quelques premières minutes. Donc, je vais demander à Morgan. Thank you very much. I think I am on. You are. Sorry, Morgan. I'm just going to no start. Problem. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the guidelines. Fiona mentioned that the guideline has been a long time on the way. But I think we are pretty happy that they come now and not a year ago because uh, we learned uh, quite a lot uh, the last year about uh, the new situation. We are in particular happy about the slogan and the inclusiveness that this slogan indicates that every move counts. I think it's a very strong message, especially when you work towards less active or even inactive, that you are not a failure if you don't reach the 150 minutes, but uh, start slow and improve from there. So, so that is a very encouraging slogan and we're happy with that. I would say that what we faced in uh, nine, 10 months ago was uh, that our habits and routines around physical activity was blocked, stopped or disrupted. And uh, I think we are looking into probably a rather huge decrease of the physical activity levels. You can say that makes the challenge and the task pretty clear and uh, the organizations that uh, we work with are, are local and they are in the front line uh, in local communities, so they are crucial. We are aware of that there are factors we cannot control. And I think one factor is what we can call fear versus the social hunger. Will our desire to be social with distance beat the fear for the virus. And, and that is something we have to, to work on. And also in the way we, we plan out the activity to make sure uh, it's dealt with. It, is, it was impossible to predict the future in the spring and in the first half of the year, depending on what part of the world you are in. But three things came up very strongly. And that was local, online and outdoor. And in all settings, it was important to share the creative new offers and the challenges. And that was one of our main tasks to, in real time, just share what was being done uh, across the world. Thanks a lot, Morgan. I mean, just in case people didn't pick up, you are the president of ISCA. Uh, you're heading up 
the International Sport and Cultural Association, important people to know that, heading up a global platform of organizations dedicated to promoting sport for all, so grassroots sport, 89 countries. And we know that in the audience today, there are a lot of people that that will resonate with, not necessarily members of ISCA, but of similar organizations. So again, we're really welcoming all of you there. I want to make sure as we carry on through our conversation today, and I'm going to turn to Valentina in right now, is that we really try and relate what we're saying to the guidelines. Clearly, COVID-19 is important, but what does it show in terms of what physical activity, activity and sedentary behavior could be how the guidelines are actually going to be real levers of change as we move out of this current pandemic. So Valentina, uh, great to have you with us. We've been moving around the world at this point. Um, so we've moved uh, from you know, sort of Scandinavia with, uh, with Morgans now into Mexico um, as the executive director of uh, Reflexioni con Responsabilidad. I probably said that really terribly, but also uh, part of the NCD Alliance in Mexico, and really importantly, leading the work on phys physical activity, author of Physical Inactivity in Mexico, a first approach. So Valentina, first of all, welcome to the webinar, but maybe you can just really put the light on some of the challenges and I guess some of the challenges, you know, particular groups of the population have been facing in terms of being able to really undertake physical, act physical activity, even more so in the next over the last few months. And the direction that you see that the lessons learned as we move out of the pandemic and we utilize these guidelines and these recommendations. Over to you, Valentina. Thank you. So Amanda, as, uh, as, as you were pointing out, and I think uh, what is very relevant about this, um, about these guides is that it has a special point of interest in certain groups of persons, for example, women. So uh, I think the pandemic has been very challenging uh, for women, especially in Latin America. So the, the, the barriers between the professional life and the home life have been erasing. So we don't have a specific time for uh, as Sarah said, and as Sandy said, and as Richard said, we don't have a specific time for making exercise or for being active because it has been blurred or the, all these uh, barriers. And I think it's especially hard for women because at least in Latin America, women carry most of the home burden. And as uh, Juana pointed out, like uh, home cars are not of high intensity. So uh, sometimes when the, the, the end of the, of the day finished because you were taking care of children and because they were homeschooling and then you also been working and then you also have to prepare the food and cooking. And at the end of the day, you may not have the energy to do what is stated in the, in the guidelines. So, then we also have a very important um, challenge that is the public space. I think Andy mentioned some of it, but uh, here, like where we have a high rates of COVID, we, uh, we have or we find the park closed. So where do we take the children or where do we go to maybe go cycling or just for a walk or a run if those spaces are being closed. So especially in high density neighborhoods where the public space is the, is the backyard where you can chill and also do other activities beyond the house, is, is, has become very challenging on how to limit the sedentary behavior as uh, I, I think Fiona mentioned at the start of, his, or, of her participation. Thanks a lot, Valentina. And that's really, it's really important. I think we'll come back to it in a, little, in a moment with you as well to actually understand what is actually, you know, what the response is rather than just talk about the challenges, actually look about how we've responded to that, how you've responded to that in Mexico. I think Andy will talk to that as well in terms of what sort of responses we can offer. Um, but we don't want to leave Richard out of the conversation any longer. Um, so Richard, again, as our fifth panelist this afternoon, this afternoon for me sitting here in France, um, you are the Chief Medical and Science Director of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. Welcome to you. 
You're a medical doctor by training. You've got a long history within the Olympic movement. Um, you were the chief medical officer for the London uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games uh, before moving into the position that you're in right now over the last few years. You're also a sports person yourself, uh, a medal winner uh, at uh, uh, rowing at the Olympics. I guess what's interesting for us is you have clearly a really unique perspective, both because you have that medical hat on, but also that you're really making the links between a professional support sports sector elite sport and this idea that really making sport available accessible physical activity for all so first of all richard welcome um we'd like to hear from you how what that really looks like in practice how you think the guidelines can be levered within the context of us moving through the pandemic today thank you amanda and uh, good afternoon morning or evening to everybody on the call um, uh, I think the first thing to say is, well, you know, these guidelines, I'd echo what everyone else has said, they're just so hugely important. Um, and uh, you might think, well, what on earth have these guidelines got to do with the Olympics? Um, you know, it's a completely separate thing. Um, but actually, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, have had um, an association with the World Health Organization since 1984. And some of you may have seen just this year, there was a reaffirmation of that with the signing of a new MOU. So, and that was really embedded around the promotion of phys physical activity, which is just hugely important to the IOC. And I think it, it's been obviously a very unique and difficult time for everybody uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And the IOC through our Olympic channel, which is like an Olympic platform, have, um, and many of you will have seen this, posted uh, workouts um, hosted by Olympians, which are inspirational, they're inventive, they're fun. And, and I think people can relate to Olympic athletes when they're going through the same restrictions, they're locked down in the same way as they are, um, and particularly inspired by Paralympians as well. Um, and it's used hashtags like um, stronger together, because although we're apart, we're doing this together, just like the virtual London Marathon that was a, a short time ago, um, and be active, stay strong, stay active. Um, and one of the priorities, and this has already been mentioned, has been mental health. And we know how good physical activity, and this is in the guidelines, is for mental health. And that's been a high priority for the IOC. We have another platform called Athlete365, which is geared at everyone who's an athlete, but also everyone who's supporting them. And so uh, th this has been giving lots of advice from experts, um, evidence-based around mental health. So this is really supported by uh, th these guidelines. Um, and I think the other point is that we must remember, and this is where I'm going to speak as a doctor, that um, sport and physical activity are fantastic medicines. But we must be careful not to medicalize the whole thing, because otherwise um, uh, people will think, oh, well, it's just on prescription. But of course, it's not. It's got to be accessible to everyone. Um, so, you know, over the years, we've tried to use the Olympics, which is, of course, an elite event. Um, to uh, inspire cities to become active global cities um, and to increase their health, physical activity and sport. And Buenos Aires was a good example of that. And I think the challenge now is to uh, using these guidelines to really persuade everybody in a position of influence around the world uh, to use physical activity, sport, as a strategy for recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, because it's something that can bring us all together and uh, bring us out of this health crisis. So thank you for the guidelines. <laughs> well, first of all, it's always good to hear that uh, the guidelines are being valued. And I, I think you know, saying that and, and, and stating it clearly is really useful for everyone to hear from everybody's perspective. I, I'd like to sort of turn straight away um, back to Valentina, if you don't mind, Valentina, and, and, and also to Andy. Um, we, we've, we've started to look at you know, a whole range of things just by entering into our conversation through COVID, but we've talked, you know, we've already touched on a whole range of different topics. We really want to understand now, you know, we, we talk about specific groups of populations in the guidelines, and we talk about them um, because they need special attention. Um, but we're also talking about in terms of what the challenges could also be in terms of different parts of the world, whether you're on the global north or global south, um, in different contexts. And it'll be really useful, I think, starting from you, Valentina, just to hear why these recommendations are important for these groups. You work specifically 
as well with, uh, with people living with chronic diseases. And maybe you can just talk a bit to how we can actually make real progress and how the guidelines are gonna help us do that. So actually, uh, we work with uh, the Mexican Coalition Saludable. Let's talk about health and the NCD Alliance uh, in a shallow report for Mexico uh, to see where we are in terms of physical activity. So I think that's also why important the guidelines are because they put a special focus in these, uh, in these groups, especially in, with the NCDs. Mexico, as well as many countries in Latin America have very high rates of uh, a high burden of these diseases. So uh, physical activity is not just um, a preventive measure that we need to overtake as a public policy, but is, it is also a measure that can be part of the, of the treatment for the people to have a better quality of life. So I think that is important. And I think that also uh, in this report, some of the insights that we got was that, especially in Mexico, the, the, the activity, the physical activity in women is very low comparing to men. So uh, to have also in the guidelines a specific uh, for women and um, pregnant women, it's important uh, for us to push for a public policy that, um, that, that all people can benefit for, not just thinking from the male part, but because women have special for example, when we talk about security in the street or lighting for them to feel safe going outside for a walk. So to have this perspective is very, is very important. I'm just going to jump in quickly and just sort of turn, uh, I'll come back to you in a moment, Andy. Just, you, just from what I've just heard from Valentina, Sarah, just be really useful to jump back to you because I know that you've been working again, just like Valentina in that space between what is happening to people in their lives on the ground and on the policy side um, and trying to pull what you talked about in terms of that jigsaw of strategies together, um, including working with specific populations. And maybe you could just describe a little bit how you've managed to do that. Yeah, um, for me, um, I'm, I'm really passionate about this and um, it, it, the guidelines themselves by highlighting those particular groups um, that um, could benefit most from it um, is, ex is exceptionally important. It essentially points us to where we need to focus our attention um, and why that matters and what good looks like. And if we're trying to work with organisations that also have and care about health as an outcome, um, often they are the organisations that will have the reach and trusted voice and credibility with those very audiences. So it provides, those guidelines provide um, the rigor and the evidence base that we can, that we can say, hey, look, look at this, it's exceptionally important for, for you uh, as an organization and, and for you, um, for the pe very people that you're trying to support. Um, in terms of then how that gets implemented, I think, um, yeah, this jigsaw puzzle that um, I mentioned, it, it's, it's about accepting that, particularly as lots of individuals um, are actually affected, uh, are often, they're often the same people affected in, in different ways. Um, so we need to have a much more rounded response and, and think about that portfolio approach where we have lots of different bits of the jigsaw puzzle that we're, that we're trying to kind of target and, and um, support and in how we progress this um, a, a across a range of different organizations. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, also again, really useful having that sort of holistic picture. Um, Andy, je vais, je, vais, je vais vous poser une question directe qui est un peu de follow-up. Uh, dans votre contexte, uh, est-ce que vous avez cette opportunité de, de cibler des, des populations spécifiques, les personnes plus âgées, les personnes avec des, uh, des maladies chroniques? Et comment vous faites pour rendre accessible, vous avez parlé du vélo, mais je pense que ce n'est pas que du vélo que vous voyez comme outil d'activité physique euh, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, nous sommes dans un monde d'information et un monde visuel. Donc aujourd'hui, l'impact que nous essayons d'avoir via cette initiative, c'est de montrer aux populations l'importance de faire du sport. Il n'y a, a pas que le vélo. 
nous avons lancé une initiative il y a moins de, de deux ans dans la commune du Plateau qui s'appelait Parcours de Santé, où chaque dimanche, on organisait des activités sportives, mais c'était de la marche à pied sur, sur une, une longue distance d'un moins de 5 km avec des seniors. Et derrière, ça a eu un réel engouement parce qu'ils se sentaient réellement euh, importants. Parce que le simple fait de faire du sport seul, ce n'est pas dans notre culture. Mais quand ils voient son voisin, l'ami d'à côté, qui s'habille chaque matin, qui porte sa paire de baskets pour aller faire du sport, ça motive. Ça motive et ça, ça crée aussi la, la cohésion et le vivre ensemble autour du sport. Donc, je pense que c'est en cela que nos politiques aussi doivent s'impliquer parce que, pour que comme le dirait l'autre, <coughs> la charité, bien entendu, commence par soi-même. Aujourd'hui, via cette initiative, on a notre partenaire qui nous accompagne sur cette initiative. Il est un opérateur économique de la commune du Plateau. Aujourd'hui, il est l'actuel il est maire de la commune. Donc, il a continué à booster cette initiative en faisant du sport chaque week-end. Et le fait que le maire même soit devant à faire du sport, ça met la population en confiance. Et ils se disent que, waouh, ça doit être réel. Euh, la sédentarité doit être réelle. Nous devons tous nous mettre au sport parce que c'est bien pour notre santé et notre bien-être. Merci, Andy. Et, et, et je me souviens que vous avez parlé de ces influenceurs mélangés entre un maire qui devient un modèle, les policiers qui aussi sont modèles locaux, ouais. Un, un, un Didi Drogba qui lui-même est un modèle, surtout pour les jeunes. Donc, ce mélange de modèles qui parle aux gens euh, à quelque chose qui va motiver euh, ceux qui ne euh, sont pas capables forcément toujours de faire du, euh, du sport, de faire de l'activité physique. OK. Donc, pour ne pas réellement se limiter que à faire l'activité physique dans une commune spécifique, on s'est dit qu'il faudrait que ça ait un impact sur toute la nation. Donc, on a essayé d'avoir un partenariat avec la direction générale. Donc, nous, on a décidé en tant qu'activiste euh, de produire des capsules de trois minutes où chaque jour, on reçoit une personnalité influente pour parler de santé et environnement. Mais l'interview se fait à vélo. Donc, la première personnalité qu'on a mis à vélo, c'est Didier Drogba. Et ça a eu un véritable impact. On dit, waouh, Didier Drogba lui-même se met au sport. Ça démontre réellement que les maladies chroniques ont un impact négatif en Afrique. Donc, il va falloir que chacun de nous puisse s'impliquer. Et ça ne s'est pas limité à là. On a réussi, via cette initiative, à mettre le premier ministre de la Côte d'Ivoire à vélo. Et après ça, il y a eu, plus, plus, il y a eu un, un effet de, de boule de neige. Et dans toutes les communes, chacun se sent impliqué dans cette notion de, de faire une activité physique régulière. Et je pense Merci. que les médias et les influenceurs aussi ont un impact sur cette initiative. Merci Donc, beaucoup, Andy. La ligne directrice, pour moi, est un tableau de bord et c'est sur lequel nous devons nous baser pour avoir une bonne conduite. Ah, c'est super. Donc, l'idée de, euh, de pouvoir suivre un peu les lignes directives, hein, c'est super important. Merci pour ce témoignage parce que ça, ça me donne très envie maintenant de montrer notre vidéo qui parle aussi de d'autres personnes les filles surtout, mais pas que les filles jeunes, dans des, euh, des endroits dans le monde où c'est vraiment difficile, dans des contextes qui sont difficiles, des contextes des pays euh, fragiles, des pays en guerre, euh, en Afghanistan, en Afrique du Sud, euh, au Cambodge. Uh, I'll switch back to English. So we're going to watch our next video now. Um, uh, let's have a look at it, and then I'm going to come straight back, uh, Morgan, to you for our, uh, to carry on our conversation. much i um uh, hold, on. Hold, on, Morgan. hold on Morgan. We're, we're meant to be seeing a video before we continue the conversation so just a moment let's see if we're going to get the video coming up Thank you. 
So not only is this another, another of our inspirational videos of, of today, but we've also noticed on the Slido a lot of questions coming up. So thank you, first of all, for all your questions. We are going to take a sort of a take a few questions live right now, if you'd like, but a lot of questions coming up around inequalities and dealing with inequalities and creating access to uh, physical activity for people who are hard to reach. And I guess, you know, that video does talk to that a bit. And he's talked to that very, uh, very effectively as well. Um, be really useful as well to maybe to bring Morgan's in from, from the work that you do with ISCA as well, in terms of how do you motivate uh, those people who are particularly uh, hard to reach? And it could be in a lot of different contexts. Morgan's? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the uh, putting lighting on uh, some of the vulnerable groups and less active groups in the uh, guidelines are very important, not only for these groups, but in general to illustrate that there is a huge group which are not reached today. And uh, there will be no vaccine to come and assist us. We, we need uh, all of us in the operational local organization to change our habits. We need also to try to make uh, better policies that prioritize lifestyle. And then we need to change the planning and the development in the local urban and outdoor environment. In particular, for the uh, hard to reach group, I think the grassroots sport and recreational physical activity organization, which are locally oriented, they know they have a position, they have the reach, but they also have a responsibility to engage with these most active. And, and this is a learning process for many organizations which are normally dealing with, you can say low competitive or recreational sport, but they even have to go further and look at the neighbor who are inactive and say, what is motivating meeting this person? It is probably not a training program for half marathon. It is probably more a friend that take you to the first walk and create a local setting for, for continuing. There's a big learning uh, process for the grassroots sport organizations at the moment that those not active or close to be active or could be active, these are those that we in particular have responsibility to reach because most of the organization also stands on some social and very inclusive values. But it comes up, uh, come to the, uh, the point where you have to offer attractive, easy to go activities in a local setup. And this is something that many organizations are working on because it's not easy. Thanks a lot, Morgan. Uh, Juana, do we have? Do you want to come up with a with a with one or two more questions? We've had a whole host of questions, and I want to make sure that we're actually really showing that we are listening because we really are listening to uh, to the audience out there. Juana, 
Thank you, Amanda. Um, so we're getting lots of questions coming through Slido. Thank you very much to everyone who's posing questions for us and for the panelists. Um, I'm just going to actually give one question to, to Fiona because we've, we've had a question about the psychological benefits of regular exercise. So we spoke earlier about the mental health benefits. Um, so maybe if I can just pose that question to Fiona and then I have some other questions for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is a really important area to uh, to discuss because it is a new development in terms of the area of science and the guidelines. So there has been a basis that physical activity can improve mental well-being. But what we've seen in the evidence of the last 10 years and reviewed by the guideline development uh, uh, committee and the process is that it's much stronger and it's showing clear evidence that being physically active can reduce the symptoms of anxiety and depression. And these are being discussed very much uh, under the, re re the COVID context that we have. And indeed, on the plus side, it can improve cognitive functioning. This is particularly important at all ages. Uh, for young children, it's about the cognitive function of learning, and there's evidence about learning outcomes improving. And that's really important as we start to think about some of those SDGs where, in fact, better learning and life chances and employment opportunities. And at the other end, it's better cognition in terms of executive function executive functioning and uh, memory and recall. All of these benefits are very important across the lifespan and the evidence shows that being more active can provide these. Is it perfect evidence? No. And is the dose response fully understood? No. We need more research in this area, but better measures of both the outcome and the exposure are underway. And we're very pleased that this has got a prominent role and an important role in the policy document. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Fiona. So, um, Amanda, I have another question. There's, there's a set of questions that have come in about social inequalities, about gender issues, race issues, barriers to physical activity. I think Morgan has spoken to that uh, to some extent. But actually, I wonder if maybe we could go to Richard from, from the IOC and, and what the IOC is doing in terms of promoting sports for all and trying to address some of those barriers that, that we're seeing for people to be physically active. No, thank you. Uh, I mean, this is an enormous priority, an enormous challenge for the IOC. Um, and uh, there are a number of programs, some of which I described earlier, but obviously at the Games themselves, and particularly at the Youth Olympic Games, there is the opportunity for people to try the vast range of sports that are included. And the other thing uh, to, that you will notice, if you look in detail at the Olympic program, at the up and coming Olympics, are some of the new events and some of the new um, sports that are included, such as three by three basketball or skateboarding. We just saw skateboarding, didn't we? Um, and sport climbing, BMX freestyle. And these are, are sports that, that uh, first of all, the youth uh, are really enthusiastic about. And secondly, they can be done in, some of them, in almost any space in an in, in a city, the, the sort of places where it's really difficult to get people exercising. And I think by recognizing that these sports and disciplines within the Olympic family, you actually help um, the government's authorities uh, put resources towards those sports and they're, they're more recognized and supported and, and they can actually happen more easily in those spaces and, uh, and they can be made available um, in the places where it's more difficult for people to exercise. And, and I suppose the other people always ask about the legacy of the games and and one of the hard legacies from the games is the olympic park the space that's created and certainly you know my own games in london where we were all working together um to not not only to have a great games in 2012 but to actually try and leave something behind and and a lot of people work very hard to do that and i know that it's very difficult to measure. But when you go around, and occasionally I get back to the UK and I go around Olympic Park, it's just wonderful to see all the different activities that are happening there. So we can create, we can use the games, obviously it's only in a very few cities around the world, to create urban spaces that encourage that physical activity and, uh, and sport to, to, to happen. Thank you. So it just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in upon it because I mean, Richard just sort of begged the question though of beyond the infrastructure, that, that the games leaves, how much more does it leave behind and does it leave behind beyond the cities where the games actually take place? Because my understanding was there was a lot more that happens in a wider sphere than that. 
Yes, well, obviously, the, there's the whole Olympic movement. So there's the National Olympic Committees in every country, um, the national federations and the international federations, which are their umbrella organizations. And they're all part of the Olympic movement, the Olympic family. And they've all recognized, I think, more and more over the last 10 or 15 years, just how important health and physical activity is. And they, they, they want and need people from all sorts of backgrounds to take part in their sports. So encouraging everyone, enabling inclusion, uh, and whether it's of disadvantaged minorities, uh, and, and we were talking earlier about girls and, and getting girls into sport and everyone's recognized uh, just how challenging but important that is. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the Olympic movement, I think, has also recognized that. Um, and uh, the, the, there is, uh, certainly at the Youth Olympic Games, it's now 50-50 male and female and it's going that way for the olympic games uh, and so that's the principle uh, that the ioc want to go by fantastic uh but first of all thank you richard i'm sorry i know i'm always there to push the conversation that bit on and you've been very nice and accepted me doing it i think what we need to do at this point we're gonna we still have the slider open so please do carry on putting your questions in there we'll try and find over the next 20 minutes another spot to slide in with our Slido, uh, another few questions, if we can manage it. Um, and we'll certainly be keeping these questions together. So carry on. But at this point though, I really wanted just to turn back, um, turn back to Valentina, if Valentina, if you're ready to do this. And I know one of the things that you've talked about is, is the challenge, and I think you all have, of getting physical activity up the agenda as something that really needs to have attention given to it, something which is really going to make that real difference in so many people's lives. And maybe you could just talk to the challenge of that. What does that challenge really look like? And, and what do you think needs to really happen to shift the current situation? So I, I think that if we talk generally about it, we can say that at least in Mexico and maybe most of Latin American countries, physical activity has been neglected. I mean, so, some of, of the things that were pointed out in the shadow report that we did was that uh, it's not a personal choice, physical activity. It is, um, it, it is a necessity. Here in Mexico, people move when they go to work, when they were going. Right now, no, all people is even doing that. And when they came back to work. So they take the bus or they may be walking or, or they may be cycling, but it's not a matter of choice. So what we need to question and what stakeholders need to question is what can we do to make an enabling environment to promote physical activity? Are we promoting safer cycling lanes for people to go to work cycling? Do we have enough lighting in the streets for women to feel comfortable going walking with children? Do we have enough parks? Are, are the parks taken care of? Are they accessible to everyone? I mean, I, I think that sort of questions need to be addressed to the stakeholders. We need to begin to see physical activity as stated in the, in the guidelines, as we need to leave no one behind because the benefits are for everyone. So I think that, and, and this, is, this may be related to some of the questions that have been coming up in the Slido, is that yes, inequality has a great uh, impact in the physical activity levels, especially in low or medium income countries. But I think also the answer and some of the things we need to be looking at and stakeholders need to be looking at is um, if we can reduce the inequality, especially focusing on women and see women as role models for their families when we talk about physical activity, I think there we have some of the answer to keep on going on physical activity. If a mother that takes care of the children and that takes care of, because mothers are the main caregivers or women in the family for people with disabilities or with NCDs, 
if we make women part of their work, we are not just impacting women, but we're impacting the whole community. So I think the guidelines in stating what needs to be done in everyone is a key message to saying no one should stay behind because the benefits are for everyone. So I, I think we, we need to come up with more that. fantastic i mean thank you thank you valentina and also very very clear about this idea of creating the environment rather than putting the blame on the individual for not being able to actually um, be more active it's a really important message um we are going to go back right now and see the earlier video uh which we were very frustrated because it wasn't quite working so our very first video um really important to have a look at sarah talked to us a little bit and gave us a sort of even more of uh, uh that desire to see it so um i understand from juana that we can uh, take a look right now and then we'll come straight back into our conversation In 2012, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm living with bronchiectasis. Welcome to this um, dance class that we're going to be doing for the next 10 weeks. One, two, three, four, up, up, down, down, we shimmy. <laughs> yes. Already? Yes. Well done, ladies. Really good stuff. I'm very, 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 very proud. Thanks so much. Really good to have actually had a good view of that. Um, and one of the things that's sort of becoming really clear through our conversation today uh, is this whole question of this ecosystem. And, and it was brilliantly described by Fiona at the beginning that we've got this wide ecosystem. You are there, as I said, nearly 2,000 participants today from so many different sectors. And it really begs the question of when there are so many uh, and the guidelines can serve so many different agendas. Uh, all these agendas lead to improved global health. But what do we need to be doing more of to move further to influence that change? How can we work better together? How can we work better in collaboration? And my sense is each of our uh, speakers today have talked somehow around that, but it'd be really good to really focus right now on how can we really use the guidelines, lever the guidelines for better collab collaboration, for faster, accelerated, scaled progress so that we meet that 15% improvement target. Um, and maybe, Richard, you talked a little bit about legacy, um, and I sort of pushed you a little bit on that, but this question around collaboration, maybe you can kick off with uh, giving us a sense of how you respond to that. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Yes, uh, one of the things I often talk about, which I really experienced in the lead up to the Games in 2012 and, uh, and since then, is the way uh, an Olympic Games brings together all levels of government, um, the city, the region, the national government and these departments that normally went along in their silos start talking to each other and they're talking to each other because of a major sporting event so the challenge is then to keep those departments talking to each other after the games they know each other already they've had hopefully an inspirational and successful event um, and actually and then you can use that intercommunication between the departments to um make sure that physical activity and the, and the enabling of physical activity is embedded in everything they all do. And that's where these guidelines really fit in because we can use the guidelines to say, this is really important. Um, we, we, we're talking to each other now, but everyone agrees how important this is. And so uh, again, thank you for the guidelines. Thanks, thanks, Richard. And that's, that's really excellent, so this idea of a catalyst. Sarah, maybe you can just build on that. I know that you had an example from Sport England that really talks to that. Hi, um, yeah, 
so for us the the best example um i mean for me the guidelines are are, are the starting point and the the key is turning them then into compelling and meaningful messages for not just the very people that we're trying to support but also the partners that can help influence them um and a good example of that is we've been working with public health england for some time now to embed physical activity um into clinical practice um and it's um it's, it's been a it's been a journey it's been um at the very beginning something that we started quite a small kind of pilot project with and then over time it's evolved and morphed into something much much bigger um, and what that's provided um, as um, both Sport England and Public Health England the opportunity to do is, is talk about it um, with other government departments um, as an example of how we can work um, more collaboratively towards the same kind of shared purpose. Um, and equally um, has been able to then provide us with more credibility to talk to more partners and build on that um, opportunity. So it just it's, it's just for me, it's just so important that we, we look at a variety of different um, partners across different sectors, um, knowing that there isn't going to be one single partner, one policy, one programme that could be simply scaled up, but it is that, that kind, of, um, kind of galvanizing all the partners um, that will allow um, really positive change to happen. So it's building that army of people, Health is everyone's business, so physical activity should be too. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Marcus, I'm going to turn to you again for that question around collaboration. I can see the clock ticking. So if you can try and keep, I know it's really hard because we all have a lot to say, but if you can try and keep your response short, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, we know that uh, the sector grassroots sport and physical recreational activities are a very cheap solution, but we also have to reckon it's uh, very complex. It's complex at an individual level because we have to change habits. It's also complex at societal level because a lot of stakeholders need to collaborate. But I'm very happy to see that uh, beside the Olympic Games, we also see countries enter into some kind of uh, friendly competition about being the most uh, active uh, nation uh, Australia has uh, chipped into that. The small country that I come from, Denmark, is also in that competition. And we see the same at the city and municipal levels. And this is a fantastic operational, political and organizational level where collaboration can make a big difference. So, so more of that because there's a huge uh, task in front of us to reach those who are still inactive. Uh, thanks, Dr. Morgans, and, and I really love this idea of the medals for the Olympic Games, but also the medals for the progress, the national progress on physical activity. Uh, on the uh, dernier, dernier question, dernier commentaire uh, de votre côté, uh, la boule de neige, vous avez parlé d'une boule de neige et la collaboration. Qu'est-ce que c'est vraiment la collaboration pour vraiment aller vers les gens qui sont les moins actifs pour les rendre plus actifs aujourd'hui? Euh, selon moi, le plus important, c'est le message qu'on véhicule. Voilà, le message lié à l'activité physique régulière doit être un message, doit être un projet d'impact communautaire. Parce que d'abord, la communauté doit se saisir cette opportunité de pouvoir faire du sport pour son bien-être et sa santé. Et secondo, on doit aussi en profiter par la même occasion via nos différents partenariats, faire du plaidoyer politique pour que le, il y ait une réelle volonté politique. Et après, il faudra aussi qu'il y ait une politique communautaire. Surtout quand il parle de politique communautaire ou communale, il faudra que l'activité sportive ne doit pas être le luxe d'attente. Ça doit être un projet essentiel. Ça doit, être, ça doit être à proximité de tous et ça doit être pour tous. Merci, Merci beaucoup, Andy. Donc, not a, uh, our last panelist, uh, Valentina, turning back to you, just to sort of wrap up going around the panelists in terms of this idea of these multiple agendas which are trying to serve a real common destination. Uh, do you have an example of how that has best happened in the space that you're working and living in right now? Yes, so um, I think that uh, it's very important all the all, all the key points that uh, all, all the panelists are are signaling, like the political will, the coordination, 
between uh, all the, the authorities. So here in, in Mexico City, for example, I think that what is key to come up with this enabling environment is that a way to start is for the physical environment. So public space is a key point. Uh, so we've been working in the recovery of public spaces. So we were working in the spaces that promote active mobility, which I'm sure Andy would like, but also we have been working in other types of public space that are more regarding to public vendors. So for example, we have this space that is outside uh, the, the most important university in, in Mexico that uh, where we have more than 40,000 pedestrians that walk through that area, but the area was very neglected and insecure. So through this program where we coordinate with the university and with the local authorities, we were able to recover that space. So people were more willing to walk through that space and stay in that space. So I think this is how we can make uh, changes that will later on will become in a snowball. Because I mean, if you go to a park and then you see the park is nice, you may go there and then you start walking and then you see in the park that maybe there is a dancing cloud class in the outside and then you see, well, maybe I will join and more people join and then you see there is a larger group and they are kids. So, I mean, the, 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 the public space invites you to make healthier decisions. So I think that is why it's very important, especially in neighborhoods with high density, to have these quality spaces where people can make healthy choices. Thanks a lot, Valentina. We definitely had this idea of space as a red thread all the, all the way through the conversation. What I really love, this is um, before I just hand back to Fiona, is the idea that we have a sense that you have made connections between yourselves as panelists today, looking to each other uh, in this sort of, in our global panel. So. From my side, a huge thank you to our brilliant five panelists. So to Richard, to Sarah, to Andy, to Morgans, uh, to Valentina, who I'm looking at right now. Um, also amazing that we've been able to have some of the questions coming in. We were definitely short of time. But Fiona, I'm gonna hand back to you just to pull this together before we close today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And can I add my thanks to the panel? And it's regretful to have to draw to a close what has been a really exciting and interesting uh, discussion. I feel as though we've only just started. Um, let me take a few minutes to try and draw together what perhaps we've covered, an ambitious agenda in just a few minutes. And I'll prime that we will be showing you the Every Move uh, counts video at the end. I know you didn't get to hear it and we're going to do that in a moment, but let's just think about what we've discussed. It's been an incredible journey through uh, the panel discussion, but some key messages have come out and let me try and uh, share those with you. First of all, guidelines are important for all of us. They're important, but we have to turn them into compelling messages. Messages for our stakeholders so that we engage with them and can work better and in collaboration as part of the ecosystem and messages to the community, sharing what is in the guidelines with everyone. We need to use the guidelines to create the environments that will enable people to be active. And this was very powerfully and repeated across the panelists. It's not a lifestyle choice. It's not a luxury. It needs to be accessible to everyone. It needs to be equitably available for everyone to lead a healthy, active life in different ways, whether it's cycling, as we heard so much about, playing sports that we know so many enjoy, or being active around the home or in the local community. The environment is a big determinant, and these guidelines must be used to influence the shaping of the environments in which we live. We need to use these guidelines to influence the influencers, the mayors of cities who actually are in control of shaping those environments, but not just mayors, we can use them to influence sport through sports. And we heard very powerfully the role that sports can play right from the very top of the IOC, but all the way down through the international federations, through organizations like ISCA and others to reach the communities, to provide the sports for all, 
so that everyone can enjoy and benefit from those. And events can leave better places, leave motivation, and then the communities and programs can encourage people to participate. Overall, the guidelines are a policy tool, a policy tool we should use for the political raising of the priority and investment in physical activity. But that won't happen unless we all use them, translate them into national policy. Only 78 countries currently have guidelines and many of those will now need to be updated. But what about all the other countries? the countries with no guidelines. Let's use these guidelines as the opportunity to change that. Have every country recognizing and having a policy position that physical activity is part of health, the environment and a sustainable future for everyone. And the for everyone came through in everyone's remarks, leaving no one behind the social, the sustainable development goal agenda. But the benefits are for all and we need an inclusive agenda in how we promote physical activity and the guidelines make that very clear. There's much more to discuss and time doesn't allow it. So we'll have to draw to a close, but I hope like I think we here at WHO will do is believe that this is the start of a conversation about how to implement the guidelines. We look forward to more opportunities and I'd like to turn to the slide because on the slide, this is where you can find out more information. What we haven't covered here is written in the documents and they're available on the WHO website the science, but also the other tools. And I'll just ask my colleagues to bring up the slides so we can show you where to get more information. I'm very excited at sharing the Trello board where you can download some of our materials and use them freely. In addition, I'd like to highlight the science is being published in collaboration with three journals, the British Journal of Sports Medicine, the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity, and the Journal of Physical Activity and Health. Web links there, free and open access. And we invite more presentations and discussions. And forthcoming is already a notice of one next week where WHO in partnership will be communicating more. But let's take that as just the next one. And I hope and invite you all to think about other opportunities. This work was enormous collaboration. And I'd like to take the final moment to thank the many people who helped the considerable work by the guideline development group, the chairs, the subgroup chairs, and all the members of the guideline development group who worked tirelessly to support WHO in developing this. Our regional offices, our country offices, and of course, the community that engaged in the public consultation, the reviewers, of course, many, many people consolidating the science to produce this. Thank you. And thank you to the staff here at WHO, the guideline review committee, that the far, final arbitrator, the team at WHO that helps produce these guidelines and as wonderful, as bright and as powerful as they are, there are many people who help. Other units have engaged also throughout the process because it's an ecosystem. And so we need our colleagues across aging and youth, childcare and maternal health, the environment, road safety, all of us are working and seeing the links and we invite you to do the same. And can I finally thank the physical activity unit because notably the work of Dwana Williamson has made this happen. And it's a brutal timeline, it's a brutal process, but today we celebrate that we've accomplished new 2020 WHO guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behavior. It's just the beginning and I invite us all to celebrate but also to work together to create the healthy and active world that we all aspire and know we can achieve. Thank you very much for joining. The recording will be available and we will be in touch with you. Thank you, good afternoon and goodbye.